Hey folks, Mr. Moffat coming at you again. Uh, this is a push topic 1.6 uh, part three video. Last time we were uh, talking about the impact of the uh, Spanish on the uh, Native Americans, and uh, we really spent a lot of time focusing in on the impact of, uh, or at least the the words of Bartolomé de las Casas, uh, Spanish priest that fought for better treatment of Native Americans who were being brutally sub, uh, subjugated by uh, the conquistadors. Uh, unfortunately, we, we kind of get caught off at the end. Uh, I'm using Screencast-O-Matic, uh, up to 15 minute long free videos, so still working on that process. So I did kind of get uh, uh, cut off there. But anyhow, to kind of round, round out the impact of the Spanish and their treatment of Native Americans during this time period, uh, Bartolomé de las Casas's words to uh, the King of Spain uh, did did not you know ring hollow. Uh, you know they were they were you know fairly well received. This did lead to what was going to be called the New Laws of 1542. This is going to be a series of rules and regulations handed down by the Crown that is going to basically uh, limit the power of the encomiendas. Uh, it is going to outlaw outright slavery of the natives uh outright uh you know eliminate forced labor try to break down a lot of the the feudal aspects of the encomienda system as it was at that time period uh which really was a a victory in terms of improving uh the treatment by the spanish however everything has to kind of be kept uh, you know, relative, uh, because this still did not provide what you would consider to be true rights for natives. There was no protection of native lands. There was no sense that natives were equal in any kind of civil way to the Spanish, and uh, it did not upend at all uh, the fact that natives were now very, very quickly at the bottom of the social ladder in, in what was their native territory. Uh, but it did, the work of De Las Casas and the new laws uh, did lead to a, you know, a growing discussion that's going to be kind of, you know, overall called the Valladolid debate, which, you know, did talk about in the Spanish world during the 16th century, you know, how should natives be treated? You know, are, are natives, you know, entitled to, you know, a sense of being treated as a Spanish person back in Europe, or are they less than? Uh, so this is it's going to lead to some discussion and debate. The bottom line, though, uh, you know, there's not going to be any real opportunity for natives to be equals, let alone prosper in the uh, the Spanish colonies. Now that then brings us to the English, and when we talk about the impact of English treatment, first off, you got to remember the English are going to be coming over about a century later than the Spanish. So when we talk about the, the English and then later the French, you want to keep in mind 17th century, 1600s, not uh, 1500s, 16th century. So I know we're playing fast and loose with the chronology here a little bit, but just kind of keep that in mind. Also, of course, remember when we talk about uh, you know English settlements, we're talking about exclusively in North America along the Atlantic uh, seaboard and what is you know, today the eastern United States versus the Spanish Empire, which stretched all the way from Florida to modern-day Texas to California, all the way down to modern-day Chile and Argentina. Anyhow, that being said, uh, we're going to be seeing, whereas the Spanish had invaded into much higher, densely populated native uh, areas, such as the Aztec Empire, the English in North America are going to be settling in places that had much smaller native communities. Uh, so you didn't really have that native population there that could easily be exploited for forced labor like the Spanish did with the encomiendas in the southern part of the continent. Uh, also keep in mind, in contrast with the Spanish, there's going to be a lot more English settlers that are going to be coming over. When we get later into the course and we talk about English colonization of North America, we're going to be seeing that, you know, the vast majority of these settlers are going to be coming over in larger numbers in terms of families, particularly those that are going to be settling in what's going to become to be known as New England, uh, rather than the typical Spanish single male conquistador. Uh, and because you can see many more English settlers coming over as intact families, uh, there's going to be far less 
uh, instances of intermarriage with natives, whereas with the Spanish, that was fairly common. So that's a big difference. Now, whereas the Spanish came in straight up as conquerors uh, in North America, the English are going to have a little bit of a, of a different, at least initial relationship with the natives. It's going to be a little bit more uh, positive, a little bit more congenial. There's going to be many examples, you know, for example, uh, you know, like we talk later about the first Thanksgiving. Uh, there's a sense that, you know, the natives are going to help the, uh, the English colonists to some degree, you know, stay alive. There's going to be a willingness to kind of trade. It's fairly positive, at least initially, but I do emphasize the, the word initially. Uh, but that's going to change, you know, pretty fast. Uh, you know, the, the natives are going to view the English almost as like this, this infestation. The English are going to come over in such large numbers in such a fast amount of time, relatively speaking, that what seemed to be just another tribe, for lack of a better uh, term, uh, to trade, you know, items with, uh, it's now going to be seen as an invasion. And this growing English population, similar to the Spanish in the South, with a European mindset of land ownership, not land, you know, commonly utilized, is going to, you know, lead to conflict. Uh, you know, very shortly, you know, as we get into the mid-1600s, uh, violence between native communities and the English are going to be very common, be it with the Powhatans down in what is going to be modern-day Virginia or the Wampanoags uh, up in New England, uh, it's going to be a fight for land. And natives are going to be coming out, generally speaking, on the losing end of these struggles. And when they, they do, uh, we're going to be seeing natives expelled from these now English conquered territories, uh, as opposed to being subjugated as slave labor, which is what you saw initially done uh, in, in the Spanish colonies. So, you know, with the Spanish, there was much more of an integration in society, be it with marriage and as forced labor, uh, but with the, and, and also a strong desire to convert to Catholicism. Uh, whereas with the English, it was, uh, you know, far less integrated and much more segregated, much more of a desire to remove natives from what were now viewed as English communities, not nearly as strong of a desire to convert the natives to Christianity. And note, when we're talking about the English settlers, we're not talking about Catholicism. We're talking about various flavors of Protestantism uh, and, you know, very, very little intermarriage with natives. So that's going to be a, a major difference there. Now, to kind of round out this section, we did want to talk about uh, French uh, treatment of Native Americans. And that's going to be, you know, even better. Now, note, uh, you know, when we talk about the French uh, relationship with the natives, uh, it is heavily, heavily, heavily dependent on trade, uh, especially what's going to be the emerging fur trade in the Great Lakes region. So we're talking about from what is now modern-day Quebec, the St. Lawrence River area, into the modern Great Lakes, down the Mississippi, down towards modern day New Orleans, Louisiana. Those areas that are going to be of French colonial control is going to be seeing a heavily, heavily economic based relationship. And once again, when I say economic, I'm not talking about the setting up of, you know, ranches and plantations and stuff like that, like you saw with the encomiendas down in the south of the Spanish, but more of an even keel, you know, trade this for that uh, with these French explorers. And note, what's also going to be different, especially in contrast with the, the English, whereas the English are going to be seen as kind of this horde invading, you know, just in, in overwhelming numbers, uh, the French population is going to be very slow to move in, very limited. You're not going to see big communities springing up very often. And so there was much less of a sense by native communities that the French are truly invading and truly taking over. Uh, it did allow for a little bit more positive commingling uh, with the uh, with the communities. Uh, but that's not to say that the that the relationship was perfect, uh, you know, because the French were not afraid in an effort to try to maintain their trading posts and expand their uh, business uh, ambitions to, as, as you can see here depicted in this, uh, 
in this uh, picture right here, uh, a willingness to take sides and form military alliances with various tribes and nations against other tribes and nations. So the French could be, you know, your friend, although the French could be your enemy, depending on who you were at a given time. So it's not like the French came in and were, you know, kind of apolitical and amilitary and just were there to try to trade uh, fairly with the natives. That didn't quite describe the reality of what was going on for sure. Uh, but generally, we tend to think that of these three major powers, the Spanish, the British, and the French, the French tended to have an overall better relationship, uh, but also at the same time, far less of a footprint in North America. And that may very well have played a critical difference for sure. Okay, so we're going to leave it there for today. Uh, we definitely cut it in under the 15 minute window for sure. Okay, uh, if you got any questions, please let me know and we'll see you later. Bye bye.